All right, thanks much. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Michael Barber. I'm originally from Newfoundland um, at Toro University of California now. I'm the LIHO. Um, and most of you in the room probably know me more so for the work that I do with the State of the Nation, um, which if you were at Blended last yesterday, you would have gotten a little bit of an overview on it, or at least last year's anyway. Um, today I'm going to be talking about something completely different. So, and I think Randy's going to pull up the State of the Nation website at some point, but um, I got to bump you. Well, right now, I said it's We've got a day and a half to do this. Okay. Um, if, uh, and I appreciate all the cooperation I get from all of the ministries and the individual programs across the country. Um, it's in its ninth year now, and it's been a wonderful um, experience to be able to work with uh, the group of colleagues across the country just to see what everyone is doing and, and how things are full unfolding in the online and blended distance world. Um, but like I said, today's talk is going to be something completely different, something that Brett and I came up with in a sort of 20 minute conversation about, you know, well, what in the world can I talk about that you know, we know from the research. And uh, basically it was along the lines of looking at what we know about the students that are occupying our classrooms today, regardless if they're in our face-to-face -face online or blended classrooms. Um, because there's a great deal of stuff that we see about them in the media and there's some research and in a lot of cases the two don't really line up and then um, a little bit at the end just looking at um, some of the things that we do know about online and blended learning from the research or at least that we can start to say are promising practices. How am I doing for audio? Is it? I'm going okay? All right, perfect. Um, so back, actually it was roughly a decade ago now, um, Adobe as part of their advertising campaign trying to get schools to adopt more of their projects, uh, ran this ad in about, I think it was 30 odd educational periodicals. And you know, ready or not, here they come. And if you take a look at this young lady, um, it came out I think around 2002, 2003, so it would have been just before the iPod came out, but MP3 players were around. And if you look at the technology that this young lady stepped out with, um, well, for many of us today, we see, you know, why she has sort of all of these devices. Uh, that you've got here, but I mean, she's got her laptop here, she's got a phone, oops, my laser thing is not working, a phone over there on the desk, she's got an MP3 player, you might recognize the old Palm Pilot uh, that you can see there next to that, uh, you know, her watch looks like you could, you know, land a space shuttle in terms of what it's got on it, um, you know, a webcam or a camera sitting around her neck, now, today, all of that is just in one little tablet type thing, but the idea behind this at the time was that, you know, this young lady is decked out with technology and she is coming to a classroom near you, so you better be ready for it. Even when you look at the verbiage that they used in the actual text portion of the ad, you know, that's really the message that they sent. And this is the message that as educators we've been getting now really for the last 20 years. Um, you know, now all of this is based upon this idea, this, this theory of generational differences, which basically says that approximately every 20 years that the people born in that kind of window have a similar set of experiences, be it historical, economical, social, but essentially the things that are going on in their world at that time mean that they are going to have a certain set of characteristics. Um, they use the timeline of 20 years, although there is a thing called cuspers in there. So if you look at today's students, you know, one of the things that you first need to know is we don't really have a good definition of whom today's students are. Um, depending upon who you read or what you read, uh, we have a bunch of different labels that we can assign or attribute to these students. You know, here's just a selection of them. I actually stopped here because I ran out of space on the slide. There were actually about nine others that I found in the literature that I could have used, so I picked the ones that I saw most often. And then, you know, once I ran out of space, I said, okay, that's kind of enough just to sort of illustrate my point here. Um, you know, but when we look at the comments that get attributed to this particular group, these are the kinds of things that you see. And while many of them are sort of consistent with each other, some of them are actually sort of directly contradictory to each other, depending upon whom you look at. You know, so if you look at the work that David Foote is doing, one of the things that he talks about is that today's youth tend to be more conservative. Whereas if you look at the work from Howe and Strauss, they talk about how today's youth tend to be much more liberal than previous generations. And so while a lot of these things tend to, you know, gamers and digital natives and media consumer multi multitasker all sort of thematically consistent, 
At the same time, depending upon which ones you're reading, we also have these contradictory messages that we're receiving. So as educators, when we look at, you know, this is, these are our constituents. It's important to know what can we really say about them that we actually know based upon research. So when you're looking at the generational boundaries that we have sort of in society right now, this is kind of the breakdown that you're getting. And it's quite interesting that up until, well basically, up until my generation, the divisions were quite clean. I'm a Gen Xer. Um, you know, and if you look at it there, there are nice clean cut divisions and we all have a single title for what we're going to call these folks. Um, once you hit the generation that came after me, it gets a little bit more messy. The first thing that you'll note is that there are multiple labels that get ascribed uh, to these generations. And the timeline that you see with these generations become a lot fuzzier. Now, I mentioned the term cuspers a little while ago. Cuspers tend to be people that are born within, I keep wanting to point, but my battery's not working, basically born within five years of a cutoff point. So essentially, People that are born in the late part of a generation may exhibit characteristics of the preceding generation by the same token, people who are born in the early part of a generation may exhibit characteristics more akin to the generation that came before. So if you were born, for example, in 1967, you may act and ascribe and fill yourself more aligned to the baby boomers than you do Gen Xers by the same token. Myself, I was born in 1975, you know, I had a computer by the time I was four years old. When I look at a lot of the things that they talk about when it comes to technology with um, this next generation here, these millennials, digital natives, whatever you want to call them, I find myself more akin to a lot of that description than I do my Gen X colleagues. You know, so I would actually be a good example of one of these customers. You know, and when we look at these most recent generations, it really does get fuzzy. I mean, Gen X, we can say about 1980, 85, somewhere in that area is when that kind of finished. But if you notice what's happening here, first of all, you're getting not just this range in there that is starting to change, but it's also shrinking. You know, if you looked at the previous slide, most of the generations were 20 to 25 years. What you're starting to see here is now they're starting to shrink in terms of the range that they represent. In some cases, only a range of 10 years, depending upon what you're looking at. Um, for those that are actually researching in the field, I'll tell you, most commonly, this generation is called Generation Y, this generation is called Generation Z, and then this generation is called Generation Alpha, as in the Greek alpha. Because typically within science, once you run out of letters in the regular alphabet, you move to letters in the Greek alphabet. Um, so that's sort of the, the scientific idea behind it. Um, now, so one of the things that's starting to change within the science of generational differences is this notion of, you know, is this approximate 10 year time period or 20 year time period, sorry, still applicable in the same way that it has been in historical type times? Um, in case you're actually wondering, this is how Census Canada or Staff Canada, sorry, um, delineates the generations. Um, you know, so they're using completely different terms and for that matter, completely different time ranges within their generational uh, labels here. Um, it's actually probably largely influenced uh, because one of the few Canadians involved in the generational differences uh, literature is a guy by the name of David Foote. He's an economist in uh, Toronto who wrote Boom, Bust, and Echo. So you can see that the titles of the generations tend to be more aligned with what he was doing. But if you're looking at the more traditional definitions and trying to line them up to or more traditional generation, sorry, trying to line them up to where they fall in the stat can one, they kind of fall in this kind of range. Um, you know, so a lot of this is sort of geographically contingent. If you're looking at the students that we have in our classrooms today, you're really looking at what I would consider two generations. Um, these generation me, and I'll use that term specifically for a while because it's one that's going to come up later, and then this next generation, which would be generation Z. Generation Z is actually quite a large, or sorry, Generation Me is actually quite a large generation. They're three times larger than mine. They were only a little bit smaller than what the baby boomers were in terms of numbers. Um, in terms of the U.S., Canada's a little bit less than this. Uh, they made up about a quarter of the population. 
uh, as of the last census that was done there. So they're a significant group of folks here. Um, and when you looked at while the generation was actually occurring, largely due to the attrition of the higher generations, they were actually growing at a rate twice what any of the other generations were. Um, the ones that would be in our classrooms for the most part are younger grades, now these generation Z guys, there's that guy. Um, right now they make up a little bit more than a quarter of the population in the U.S. It's roughly 22% of the population of Canada, if I remember correctly. They're actually a larger generation from an American standpoint, in terms of numbers, than both the baby boomers and the millennials or generation me. And they actually have a couple of interesting characteristics. One of them in particular, um, and throughout North America, is actually almost half of that particular generation are non white um, which from a North American standpoint, we've been hearing about it for a long time in Canada, about how the visible minority will become the majority at X date. And usually the Canadian date is 20 to 30 years ahead of the American date. Um, you know, this generation is really where that tipping point is starting to happen. Um, some other things that we find out about these, this particular generation, if you're looking at sort of the timeline that we have for these kids, these are the ones that, depending upon what number you were using, could be born as early as the late 90s, 2000. Um, it could be starting as late as 2006. So when you're thinking in your head, these are the kids that are in elementary school, trickling up into middle school. Um, some of the things that we actually have about them are kind of interesting, and many of them, as I was looking through, finding you know what we know from the research about this particular generation. Because I'll be honest with you, and say most of my work had been with the previous generation, the millennial generation, me group. Uh, it's kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, the kids that we have today, for all of the things that you hear about Snapchat, social media, and all the other stuff that they're doing online, the younger group that's coming through, so the group that would be middle school or less tend to be much more risk averse than previous groups. Um, and the one that actually surprised me um, was the double level of church attendance in any of the previous generations. Um, now, I think a lot of that gets attributed to there's been a large growth in the United States and a lot of these non-denominational, more faith-based kinds of institutions. So they're not necessarily traditional denominations as we know them. Um, and that seems to be where a lot of the growth is coming from. Um, but it ties in with a lot of the other things that we hear about. You know, they tend to be more socially responsible, they tend to be more interested in the, the state of the planet, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, and regardless if you're looking at the millennials or this generation Z group, um, one of the things that we can say is, you know, they're not sort of, they're not my generation, basically. I mean, my generation, Generation X, I mean, you know, we were the generation of heavy metal and gangster rap and, you know, all those other wonderful things. Uh, that came about. We were sort of the pessimists when you look at that generational list. Um, you know, this generation is really starting to recast how we view youth in a much more positive and optimistic kind of way. So when we look at these particular labels, what can we actually say from the research that we know can be ascribed to these? One of the earliest folks that started talking about students that we see now is a guy by the name of Don Capstock. He wrote a couple of books. Uh, the first one was Growing Up Digital, which came out in about 97, 98. The other one was Growing Up Digital, which came out about 2002, 2003. And one of the things that Pascot talked in there was essentially, he was talking about children of the baby boomers, so he was actually including the late group of Generation X in here. So I would actually be part of this next generation um, when you're looking at the numbers. But he said that because we've been surrounded by technology for our entire life, that while every single generation has a little bit of a technology gap, you know, you understood technology better than your parents. You were much more, uh, you had much greater facility with technology than what your parents did in much the same way your children had much greater technology than uh, facility than what you did. Um, but he said that that gap had gone so far that if you're sort of thinking about it like a race, it was almost as if the, this generation had completely lacked the previous one. Um, now, it's important to start to look at where a lot of these things come from. So let's start with Tascott. Now, Tascott, basically, when he did his original book in the late 90s, his data, and he had, you know, the survey data, probably about 15, 16,000 survey responses, but those surveys were circulated in online communities like MySpace, and uh, Friendster, and ICQ, and other electronic means. Think about this. 
late 90s, 20 years ago, folks that are involved in online communities, what kind of kids are you going to be looking at in the first place? You know, I'm sure if I walk down on the main street down here and talk to people about, you know, what's the best team in the NHL, I'm going to get an answer. It might not be an accurate answer, but it's going to be an answer that I can probably predict now because I'm essentially going after a very specific population. And that actual example works north of the border. When I use that example, you know, in the United States, they, I usually use St. Catherine Street because, you know, I'm a half fan, and people look at me like they don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but so that works, and, you know, so, but essentially he's using a self-serving sample. You know, he already knows what the results are going to be based upon the type of kids that he's asking. Um, similarly, you saw the millennials um, folks earlier, and these were the ones that were talking about how this generation of students, you know, are recasting how we see them. It's interesting because these guys are also based upon survey research, a couple of thousand responses. Their sample comes from Fairfax, Virginia. How many people here are familiar with where Fairfax, Virginia is? Anyone? One person. Essentially, it's just inside of the D.C. area. It's actually right across the Potomac River. It's where the Pentagon is located, and it's essentially the entire intelligence and defense community of the United States is located there. The average household income is twice that of the national average. The average family has two working parents, both of which have graduate degrees. Sounds like your typical kind of American family, you know, the type you might find in, say, downtown Detroit or South Central LA or, you know, Ferguson, Missouri, as an example. You know, I mean, essentially, they ask one of the most exclusive elite communities in the entire United States. They went to kids in that community and said, okay, tell us about yourselves. You know, if I'm rich, white, and living in America, well-educated parents, I'm going to be pretty optimistic about my chances, too, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, and so again, this is another example, and, and this is one that gets a lot of play in the media in particular. And it's an example of one where basically, you know, the results are determined totally on the population that they're looking at. One of my favorites, Mark Prince, and I always say one of my favorites, because he's one that we hear a lot of in education, um, and he gets used a lot. I know Ian Jutes, who's from this province, talks about Prince a lot. Prince is best known for his idea of digital natives. Essentially, that we can divide society into two groups of people, digital natives and digital immigrants, in much the same way that um, when we look at immigrants and natives of a culture, that natives of a culture just have an innate ability to do things, they just naturally know how to do it, or immigrants, while well, they may gain facility with it, while well, they may gain an understanding of it, they will never have the sort of nativeness, as he calls it, that someone who was born into that culture. Now, Prinsky's research is basically based upon his own unsystematic observations of his kids, you know, neighbors' kids, his family's kids, you know, and so what kind of guy is Prinsky? Well, He's a guy that gets paid $25,000 for speaking engagement. So that should tell you, first off, sort of what socioeconomic status level he falls into, um, which would tell you a little bit about the type of community he might live in, so the type of kids he might be seeing. You know, again, if I'm interacting with a group of rich, fairly well-educated youngsters, I'm going to get an, a particular idea of this. You know, I think one of the things that you're seeing here is the fact that when you're looking at the generational differences in literature, in fact, most of what we get bombarded with in education in terms of these labels are based upon no research at all or based upon flawed research. And it's a really difficult thing because we've been hearing for the last 10, 15 years that, you know, kids' brains are wired differently today because of technology and we need to teach them differently and we need to use technology because that's how they learn when all of that is based upon no research whatsoever, or research that is basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what can we actually say about this particular generation? Because there is actually a line of inquiry that we have that has been, is, is quite reliable and valid when you look at uh, the methodology that it's used. And the one thing that we can say is that this generation is more narcissistic than ever before. Gene Twenge, who has been doing work um, with the Narcissism Survey Index, uh, which is a validated instrument that was developed in the 1950s, um, the, have been administrated regularly to college freshmen and college seniors, 
although in the past decade they've actually been administrated to middle school and high school students as well. And it essentially measures the level of narcissism that we have within society. And it's actually quite interesting because when you look at the data, which has been collected since the 1950s, which is nice because we've got like 60 years of data that we can look at. And there's a really interesting trend. Narcissism in the 50s is like here. And then in the 60s is like here. And then 70s is like here. And 80s is like here. And even the early 90s is like here. And then when you hit the late 90s, it's like up here. Basically, around the late 90s, they go from anywhere between two and three times the level of narcissism that we've seen in any previous generation. You know, this isn't something that's been sort of every generation's been getting a little bit more narcissistic, and now we're just at the top end. You know, this has really been, okay, we've been a nice steady line, and all of a sudden we shoot up. And, you know, here's, um, maybe one of the reasons why, you know what I mean, let's face it, kids today, and we can say this really about kids for the last 20 years, from the time they come out of the womb, is it any reason why they think they're the star of their own Hollywood movie? Not saying that parents are the only people to blame about this, but when you start looking at some of the characteristics that we see in these particular students compared to previous generations, and that idea of jumping between 3 and 4%, when you look at the percentages here from things that we see from the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, compared with the results that we get from the 90s and the early 2000s, you, know, you will see that jump of 2 to 3 to 4 times as many, you know, from 34% to 74%, 42 to 86, 18 to 48, you know, and that's all things that are measuring sort of the level of me, me, me when it comes to the students that we have in front of us now. Um, you know, so when it comes to this particular generation, that is, in all honesty, the only thing right now that we can say about the students that are in front of us that is based upon reliable and valid research. Um, now, that also comes with some caveats as well, one of which, obviously, if you've got narcissistic kids, chances are, you know, they're that way for a reason. And, you know, I'm sure everyone in this room can um, relate particularly to this kind of thing. You know, and I often actually use a cartoon with this instead of the millennial rising where it comes from, but I'm sure you've all seen it. You know, it's the cartoon that has the two teachers with the parent and the student teacher conference there. You know, and it's the 1980s or something, you know, and parents are looking at the student and says, you know, because they got an F on the report card and saying, what's wrong with you? And then the next screen is the kids, uh, you know, the same scene today, and the parents are looking at the teacher and saying, what's wrong with you? Um, uh -huh. That's one of the corollaries that come with this level of narcissism that we have in, with the, this generation too. You know, because it's all about me, you know, young Johnny or young Susie can do no wrong in the eyes of the folks that, you know, are responsible for rearing. So what else can we actually say about this generation that goes beyond just the generational differences literature? And, um, you know, there are a couple of things that we can say with some reliability, although in all honesty, it's not necessarily the things that most people think. Um, so we often hear that this generation is, you know, master multitaskers. When uh, using, you know, multiple technologies, you know, watching TV and doing their homework, what have you. And you often see studies like this, and, you know, I'll point out, you know, here, a new study conducted by high school students finds that some youngsters do equally well on tasks, you know, and there's a whole two-page article about this. And it's not the first one, actually. This is the first one I, I have, like, nine of these that I do when I do just a generational differences presentation. I actually have nine slides with articles on it. I like this particular one in, uh, because if you look at the second last sentence of the article, this is what they tell you. <laughs> so there's a two page article that talks about how this generation of students are really good at multitasking and in many cases will do as well as their multitasking as what previous generations did when they're focused upon a single thing. And then in the second last sentence, this is what we find out. And, you know, it's not something that is surprising to us because we actually have about 50 years of research that looks at distracted um, learning. You know, so here's another example that's a decade old now, you know, where you're looking at essentially three conditions here. You've got the first condition where they are basically spending their full attention, both when the instruction is being delivered and when the instruction is being tested. 
The second line is when there's a distraction when the instruction is actually taking place. So actually there's music going on while the teaching is happening. And then the third condition there is when there's distraction going on when they're trying to remember the information. So when they're essentially being tested for it. And as you can see, the full attention once initially, it actually works pretty good. They're essentially asked to memorize a passage and then write out the number of words. And as you see coming across the bottom, these are the number of seconds and the number of words they're remembering per <coughs> second accurately. And for the first 10, 15 seconds or so, they're all pretty close. But basically, as time goes on, not that much time, I mean 15 seconds to try to write back, okay, what did I hear, isn't all that long. The lines are quite significantly. You know, and this, like I said, goes to research that we've seen for 30, 40, 50 years when we look at uh, distractions. You know, when you're trying to learn, it takes longer, you remember less, uh, you're less likely to remember it over the long term, so short-term memory tends to be pretty good, but long-term encoding actually goes down quickly, which is why when you say to your kid, you weren't listening to me and they can repeat back to you word for word what they just said, you know, if you were to ask them 10 minutes later, they wouldn't remember a thing. Because that idea of encoding, you know, that short-term processing will come back quickly. That long-term encoding uh, tends to be a problem when we're looking at these. And if you actually go and look at multitasking or distraction while learning and just do a Google Scholar search, you'll end up with over 600,000 studies that have been done on this, again, dating back 30, 40, 50 years. Um, you know, so the fact that, you know, um, just because they think they're good at it, I can guarantee you they're not. Just because their parents think they're good at multitasking, I can guarantee you they're not. The other thing that we can talk about a little bit is the level of digital savviness that this particular generation of students have. Because one of the, regardless if you're looking at a gen the generational labels or not, regardless if you're listening to Task or Frenzy, there is just this general opinion within society that these kids are probably even said this yourself about how you know you can hand your phone or your tablet over to your four-year-old child or nephew or niece or whomever grandchild and they just know what to do they just you know can go and play with it they can do all these things that i can't do with it and that leads to this kind of impression that this generation is particularly digitally sad and it's interesting because the research that's been done has actually found the exact opposite um, while students in the two most recent generations so the Generation Me Millennials group and the Generation Z group, um, they tend to have a really good surface level knowledge of technology, but in terms of actually using it for competence, uh, being able to troubleshoot with it, being able to learn or work with it, they actually are pretty damn lazy about it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, you know, so they have a great, uh, well, to use a, a colloquial phrase, you know, their knowledge when it comes to using technology is a mile wide and an inch thick. Um, in fact, to be perfectly honest with you, it's the baby boomers in the room that actually have some of the, the greatest technical competency, um, which is, you know, for those of you people that are at the late boomer era, um, should make you a little bit proud. Um, you know, essentially, while you might not be able to use as much technology, and it might take you a little bit longer to use it, once you figure it out, your ability to apply it to other things within your daily life, is significantly higher than any other generation. Um, Gen X actually comes in second on, on that measure, so, um, and not by a lot either, so I'm only, you know, just behind it right now. Um, what else do we know about our online learners in particular? Because there is a growing field of research when it comes to online and blended learning, and um, one of the first things I have to sort of give you up front is um, at least uh, to get to be able to parse out some of the literature that you're seeing um, is to sort of describe the two conditions under which most of this literature has been done. Um, so we've got supplemental online learning. You guys are all familiar with this. This is when you've got a student that's in the classroom that's taking one or more classes online. So as you can see here, you know, we've got three schools set up here. We've got students from those three schools. Uh, there is an online teacher who happens to be on the school on the screen left. Um, in addition to that online teacher, you've got facilitators in the other schools that are available. There's, you know, tech support there. There's obviously the administrator and guidance and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's the trappings of a regular school and all the supports that that entails. 
The other model that the literature tends to take is a full-time model, which we often see in the U.S. in the guise of cyber charters. Um, but essentially, that's where you've got an online teacher that is remotely located. In the U.S., it's often in a strip mall somewhere, um, because that's where the school happens to be located. Many times, the strip mall is also owned by the company that runs the school, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, you've got all the students learning from their own homes, and within the U.S. model in particular, the parent or guardian actually assumes a specific role known as a learning coach. And within that model, these online, full-time online programs actually provide training for the learning coach and create learning communities for those learning coaches. Because let's face it, I mean, this is kind of like homeschooling. So the parent is doing a lot of both the instructional support, but also the soft skills support. So within those two contexts, one of the things that we can say is the supplemental environment tends to have a bimodal distribution of students. We've got a lot of students that are at risk, struggling, have failed. We've got a lot of students on the other end that are taking advanced placement courses, foreign language courses, advanced science and math courses that they can't get in their schools. There is very little enrollment, um, at least represented within the literature, that comes from that middle. You know, that solid C student that tries hard, gets a C, and you know, that's where they're going to be most of their lives. That kind of student tends not to be represented in the literature that we see when it comes to online learning. So when we're looking at these two groups, um, the first thing that we can say about the top group, and I'll talk about that first, so those high-end learners. Um, the research that we have about that is they tend to do fairly well in the online environment. You know, if you look at studies, um, and several of these are actually Canadian studies, um, dating back to, actually the first one started in the late 90s, um, and they're still continuing to this day. As you can see, there was one done at Harvard there in 2014. For the most part, those online students are tending to do as well or a little bit better than their face-to-face -face counterparts. Um, you know, and these are, again, comparing these sort of high-end students. But it's interesting when you sort of get behind this particular research and see what's going on. So the first thing you need to do is, okay, well, let's take a look at the two groups that are actually being compared here. One of the things that we see is that for the most part, the face-to-face -face groups have a full range of learners in them. And this kind of makes sense of it. If you're doing assess an assessment that in many cases isn't mandatory, I walk into this room and I hand a test in front of you all, most of you are going to do it. You know, because I'm standing here in front of you, the person next to you is doing it, you know, there's a sense of social pressure, there's a sense of peer pressure, there's a sense of teacher pressure to actually do the assessment. If you're in an online class where you never see any of your colleagues, where you never see your teacher, and you get sent this, in many cases, non-mandatory assessment that you've got to complete, come through your inbox, and I'm hoping all of you are thinking exactly what you have to do. Um, for that matter, if you're thinking about when you see this State of the Nation email for an individual <laughs> program survey or ministerial request come through, that if you don't have to fill out and it comes through your inbox, two, three, and four, and five times. It's very easy to hit delete when you see that. You know, the folks that do respond, that do complete that thing, tend to be a very select group of students. And when you look at the type of students they tend to be, these are the ones that we're talking about. Now, I'll give you a second to sort of look at this, and, and I, I love the one that uh, Margaret Hall and Bill Muir has, has up there, because it, while it's dated, when you're looking at this particular top end group of students, it's probably the most complete definition or description that we have. Now, as you're reading through these, ask yourself, we're taking these students and they are only performing about as well as or a little bit better than the full complement of learners in the classroom. So even for our high end students, it's not uncommon to see a drop of anywhere between 5 to 15% in their grades from their online class to their face-to-face -face class. And let's face it, it's not because they all of a sudden got dumber when they logged in. You know, it's because we do not provide a high quality, in many cases, online learning experience for them. So even our high-end learners tend to drop off, in some cases quite significantly. 15% drop is a significant drop. You know, and it gets even oops, my slide there, the sequence there. Uh, it gets even worse when we look at our low end learners because the perception out there is that online learning is a great way to allow these students to catch up. 
Um, this was a report that was put out in September of 2015 that talked about how online credit recovery can be a great way to allow students to essentially catch up on courses that they failed so that they can still meet their on-time graduation. Um, it's quite interesting because about two weeks after that came out, the first of these series of reports uh, that have been coming out of uh, U.S. research centers, so uh, the regional educational labs are relevant. Uh, there are, I think, seven of them in the U.S. They're geographically located, but essentially they're federally funded. Um, so the ones that you see up there, there's two from the southeast, and the blue one in the middle is the northwest one, where um, they basically get a five-year contract to do research that's important to their particular region. And in the case of these ones here, the AIR, the American Institute of Research, which is based in Illinois. Um, these are all studies that have looked at online credit recovery. And when you look at the type of results that they found, it's quite sobering compared to the work that we see about the potential for online learning to be able to serve these kinds of students. You know, so typically speaking, students involved in the online credit recovery have a much more negative opinion about school in general and specifically about the subject area that they're taking. Um, while in some cases, immediately following the course, they will actually have success rates at roughly the same levels as their face-to-face -face credit recovery folks. So essentially, they'll get the credit back, but when you look at the long-term success of these students, they tend not to graduate on time. They tend to have poor performance in subsequent courses in the same level. So while it's a good way for them to be able to get the credit, they don't actually learn much about it. Because when they get into the next course and have to use the information that they were supposed to have just learned, they tend to fail at higher rates than the folks that did face-to-face -face credit recovery. They tend to have much lower on-time graduation rates. They tend to have much higher dropout rates than what their face-to-face -face credit recovery folks have. Um, so when we look at our full-time students, it actually gets even worse. And I hate to say that, but that is the case. Um, we basically have probably 15 years of research now that are looking at full-time online programs. And one of the things that we see consistently time and time again uh, is the fact that these students tend to do absolutely abysmal compared to their face-to-face -face counterparts. Um, some of the statistics that you'll find throughout that is they have a four to five times more likely chance of dropping out of school. Um, they often fall further behind in the online environment than they would have if they had just stayed in a face-to-face -face environment. Their on-time graduation rates are um, much, much less. Their success rates on statewide standardized assessments tend to be somewhere between a quarter and a third of students actually succeeding, whereas in most states, the average tends to be between two-thirds and 75 percent. So essentially, there are three to four times less likely to have success in their courses. And one of the things that they will tell you is that, particularly in the U.S., the students that are involved in full-time online learning, they're doing so as they lack resort. You know, these are students that have had no success in the face-to-face -face environment, so they're trying the online environment and the hope that they can have success. The problem is the research doesn't bear that out either. When we look at the type of student that we have in the full-time environment, um, you know, well, this is the kind of thing that you get. When you look at sort of all of the markers that we would normally use in the U.S. for being an at-risk student, you know, minority students are much more likely to be at-risk than Caucasian or white students. Students that are receiving free and reduced lunch, so have a lower socioeconomic status, tend to be at a much greater risk for not having success. English language learners tend to be at a much greater risk for not having success. Um, special ed students tend to be at a much greater risk for not having success. When you look at the nature of students in these full-time programs, they tend to, on all of these categories, enroll a smaller population of these kinds of students. In fact, the one thing that they do enroll more of than the face-to-face -face students are actually, or face-to-face -face classrooms, sorry, are gifted students. They actually have four times the number of gifted students taking full-time online learning than what the face-to-face -face classrooms have. You know, so again, to go back, you know, here's just three results from the previous slide. You have a much uh, population, of, uh, population of students that at least by their markers, have a much greater chance of success than when you're looking at the gifted students. You know, there's a higher percentage of talented students, but this is the kind of results that we're getting. Um, you know, when we're looking at blended learning, I'll be perfectly honest with you, there is not a lot of research out there, and the research out there tends to be focused 
specifically if I'm blended schools as opposed to blended programs. And I'll use that distinction very clearly. A blended school is an entire school that is created around a blended environment. And regardless if you're looking at the US or Canada, that tends to fall under one of Horner and Stalker's seven classifications. Um, in the US, it tends to be mostly through cyber or through uh, charter schools that they have. And so if you're familiar with programs like Rocket Ship Education, Carpe Diem, and uh, the KIPP schools and those kinds of programs. Those are the ones that are using these kinds of blended environments, but it's done throughout the entire school. And the one thing that we can say from them, there was actually a study that came up from the National Education Policy Center um, last April, is that those schools actually do worse than what the full-time online schools do. Uh, to date, other than a few isolated studies, that um, really don't have much in the way of methodological rigor. We know little to nothing about how students will perform in a blended program. So it's the type of environment where you might have a teacher that's doing blended learning within their school, or you might have a grade level that's doing blended learning. So it's not a whole school experience, or even just teachers that are doing blended in some cases, and then normal instruction in other cases. Um, there's no reliable and valid research that we have in terms of what students will do in that type of environment yet. Um, one of the reasons for that is it's very difficult to actually be able to pull out good data from that. You know, I mean, I'll use this province as an example, although I do use any province, to be perfectly honest with you. If I wanted to go in to look at the results on the graduation exam here in Alberta and compare how face-to-face -face students did with blended students, I can't. There's nothing coded within the system that would allow me to do that. In fact, there's nothing coded at the school level to allow me to do that. I could actually go and ask the administrator of every single high school in this province to be able to describe to me, you know, how they're delivering it. And even then, I still would not be able to come up with an accurate data set to be able to determine how the blended learning programs were doing compared to regular instruction or online instruction or anything else for that matter. Um, you know, so. There are some other things that you know we can glean from the research, and they're less about the students than they are about the practices. Um, oops, I have myself hurt. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, familiar, Project Tomorrow does a speak up survey every year in the U.S. It's actually quite interesting because you get essentially all these K-12 schools throughout the United States that are participating in them. Uh, you can see the states there that actually have a high number of schools or high percentage of schools that participate. But essentially what they do is they wanted to find out um, the learning and habits and preferences, if you will, of students throughout the United States. And they do come up with some interesting kinds of things. Um, so the red here are the middle school students, the green here are the high school students. But, you know, it's kind of interesting when you start looking at some of these results and the things that they value. For example, how they define success in their academic careers. Um, oddly enough, good grades is right at the top, so apparently extrinsic motivation tends to work fairly well. Um, getting into a good college is also the secondly highest rated one there, at least for the high school students. You know, so again, that idea of intrinsic motivation. Um, family pride, school honor, personal learning goals are at the bottom. Those are all intrinsic kinds of things. And that shouldn't surprise us when we think about back to the generation me type of characteristics. You know, that idea of having, you know, this meaningful goal in life and learning for the sake of learning, that kind of thing is really a foreign concept to the students that we have now. School and learning is just a means to an end. Um, when we look at their use of social media and other technology, um, not surprising that as they get older, they tend to use these tools a lot more. Um, keep in mind this is self-report from the students, so just because they say that they are, you know, using tools to um, for collaborative writing, is that good collaborative writing? Um, is that effective collaborative writing? Probably not, um, based upon what we know about this generation of students. Um, similarly, when we look at um, how they use these tools, again, for their own learning, uh, so do-it-yourself learning at work, here's the number of students that have reported doing certain things to try to uh, use technology and complete social media to improve upon uh, their own learning experience. It should surprise many people, given what we hear about them, that these numbers are so small, actually. Um, when you look at what we know about their level of digital savviness and that idea that just because they 
have some knowledge of how to use the technology. They don't necessarily know how to use it well to do things. It shouldn't surprise us that we've got such small numbers here of them actually using the technology to do things in an effective way. I always like this one because as an educational technology professor, one of the things I often get asked by principals is, you know, should we allow devices of whatever kind, mobile, what have you, one-to-one -one environments in the classroom? This is what the students think. Um, and if you did let them use their devices, this is what they claim they would do with them. It'd be interesting to actually, you know, do a little bit of a test to figure out if I did allow everyone to come into the classroom with their phone and, um, you know, have it hooked up to the school Wi-Fi. Are they actually doing it with them? You know, are they actually doing these kinds of things? Um, you know, particularly if you had school given devices, because then you could actually have some kind of screen recorder on them. So you could go back and actually track the amount of time that they spent doing these things. But these are the things that they say they would do with their mobile devices if you allowed them to use them as a part of their learning. Um, they actually do see a lot of benefits in um, online learning, and there are many of the things that we see coming out of uh, the literature and a lot of the media and advertising for these types of things, some of which are actually, I think, quite good pedagogically. And for many of us that teach in the online blended environment, we probably experience some of these. Um, the last two in particular, I would say, are not just perceived benefits, but based upon the research that we have in the field, they tend to be actual benefits that we find in the research. Um, the ability to be able to go back and review material uh, tends to be one of the things that we find students do and in fact they have a great success with in the online environment because the materials are there on demand as opposed to during the 60 or 75 minutes that you're in the room. Uh, similarly speaking, if you don't have to see your peers, it's a lot easier to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, particularly if you're in a completely asynchronous environment where, you know, I mean, if you're in a synchronous environment like we are today, if you ask a question, you know, in the chat box, everyone for the most part can see that it's there. In the asynchronous environment, for the most part, that means emailing the student or setting or emailing the teacher or setting up, you know, a private Skype session or synchronous session with the teacher. You know, so that social pressure of, you know, looking down gets removed. And that's also one of the things that we can bear up in the research. Um, the one caveat that I'll tell you if you do start following the speak up stuff is this idea of the fact that it is based upon student perception. Just because a student, or for that matter, the parents, want their learning or their education offered in a particular way, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way in which we should do it. You know, if you ask kids what they wanted for breakfast most mornings, chocolate would be the answer. Um, it certainly wouldn't be, you know, fruit or any of the other type things that are actually good for them when you actually, you know, look down at it. And as educators, we're not just highly trained, but in many cases have years of experience on what works and what doesn't work in education. Um, most of us have advanced degrees in this. We've consumed a lot of um, you know, research that does there. We have our own practical experience in this. You know, to say that some seven-year-old knows better how they should learn than what we do, kind of a bit humorous if you ask me. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have a voice at all, but the fact that they should be the sole arbiter of, you know, how they go about it. Uh, I think it's a little bit condescending being an educator, perfectly honest with you. Um, but that's the conversation that we hear, particularly in the United States, when you hear all this stuff about personalized learning and individualized instruction, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, and, and everyone in this room knows this better than most, um, you know, technology isn't better than a good teacher. And the research shows that out, our own experiences show that out, um, you know, and the introduction of technology into a system is never going to actually make any difference in the system. The only time technology will make a difference is if it results in a change in practice. You know, we've seen this many, many times before. We've got all these wonderful electronic whiteboards in the classroom. If all I do is stand up and lecture the same way I would have if I had an overhead projector here, the technology hasn't changed my practice, which means the learning that's happening in the room isn't going to change. You know, the only time that we see gains in learning is when the technology changes the pedagogy that is being used in the room. Looking at some of the specific things that we can recommend from the research, uh, the first thing I will caution against the term best practices. I actually hate that phrase. Every time I hear it, I have fights with people over that. 
Same thing when I hear student-centered learning. I think fights over people with that too, because they are both two of the dumbest pejorative things that I have ever heard. And as you speak, um, they are designed basically to discount and really, I can't even think of a polite word to say about it, to discount direct instruction. I mean, that's really what it, it amounts to in most cases. And the funny thing is, when we actually look at the research around what actually is effective in terms of learning, um, and John Hattie probably does the best research in this area, and if you're not familiar with his work, I recommend picking up his book, Visible Learning. Um, actually, there's four of them out there now. Uh, visible Learning, Visible Learning for Teachers, Visible Learning for Professional Development, I can't remember what black one is, but essentially there's a white one, a blue one, a green one, and a black one. Um, for teachers, I always recommend the blue one. If you're more of a research man, I recommend the white one. Um, you know, but direct instruction actually does quite well when you look at what we know about how students learn and that kind of thing. Um, best practices implies a specific set of things that have been done from a research standpoint. This is essentially what best practices implies have happened. So if all of these things have happened and the pedagogy or strategy or instructional design model has been found to be effective, then yes, we can say it's a best practice. The problem is when you look at educational research, typically speaking, this is what we know from the research, and yet we still use the term best practice. And that's really a problem because, you know, when you look at the research in K-12 online learning as an example, the K-12 online and blended learning, we don't have a lot of that kind of systematic study. We've had a lot of these one-off individual studies that have shown some promise, but for the most part, we, you know, are still struggling with it. I love Kiri Rice's def uh, description here, a paucity of research exists. You know, and, and that's still true to this day. In fact, the number of researchers involved actively in K-12 online blended learning now are so small. I could sit here and within about a minute give you the names of every single scholar that's actually doing work in this area. It's that small a community. Um, some of the things I can recommend, if you're not familiar with the work that was done at the Virgin High School Global Consortium, it's now called VHS Collaborative, I would highly recommend uh, the work that was done there. They were an online supplemental online program that was created in 1997 with Star Schools grant from the federal government. They got five, uh, sorry, $7.5 million over a five-year period, but as a condition of that, because it was a federal grant, they had to have a formalized evaluation process. And probably one of the best examples I've seen of this, they actually, the virtual school themselves, the online program themselves, identified seven goals that they said by the end of these five years, we want to be good at these seven things. And they required the evaluators to actually judge them on those things. So it wasn't like a bunch of researchers coming down and saying, okay, we're going to, you know, research the types of things we think are important. The program themselves said, this is what we want to accomplish, and evaluate us based upon that. So they actually had the first three years, they had three annual evaluations. Uh, the PDFs are actually all online. Their fifth year evaluation was published as a book that you can pick up on Amazon called uh, Virtual High School Teaching Generation B. Um, it's, I think, relatively cheap now because it's like 2002 publication date. So, um, well worth picking up. They actually had a specific um, evaluation done on effective online course design. They also had a specific evaluation done on the effect of pedagogy in an online course. And even though that research is anywhere between 15 and 18 years old, in all honesty, it's still the best research that we've got out there. And speaking to someone who's read about 90% of the stuff that's come out in our field, I still think it is the most applicable. Um, if I were to tell anyone who's setting up an online program, you know, what's the three things that I should read when I'm starting this up, it would actually be these three things, or these things up here. You know, it wouldn't be things that have been published last year or the year before. These things, I think, are still fundamentally sound when we look at how to design and deliver online courses, typically the two subject-specific evaluations that they did. Another reasonable resource is one that the International Association for K-12 Online Learning put out. Many of one of you that knows me um, knows that I think very little of this organization. Um, but they did publish a pretty good book in this. It was actually led by Rick Furtick, I hope the faculty member at the University of Florida. Um, they had a Bell South grant where they actually had 13 statewide supplemental programs that they worked with. And the program essentially would download all of their LMS and SIS data to the folks at the University of Florida. And then they would ask the folks at Florida, 
questions about that data. And the guys at Florida would do analysis and crunch the numbers and provide them back answers to those questions based upon student and teacher behaviors that were actually in the system. Um, this book was a result of that research. So what you have is essentially a chapter from each of the programs that talk about that relationship that they had with the researchers. And I think one of the things I like about these two is, again, it's not researchers coming in and researching the esoteric interest that they have. It's researchers that are trying to use data to answer the challenges and problems and goals of the online programs themselves. A um, couple of other things that I can sort of mention in promising practices, so these are things that we've seen that show some good uh, results, but we really can't say our best practices at this point. Um, the work that Nikki Davis has done around the delineation of the role of the teacher, I think is quite good. It came out of a 50 grant when she was at Iowa State. So essentially, in a classroom, or like today, you know, I'm responsible for designing the instruction that I'm doing for you here today. I'm responsible for delivering it, and I'm also responsible for facilitating. In an online class, that tends not to be the same person. You have one person that will design the content. In some cases, that person might teach it as well, but not all the time. And then there's someone at the local school level that's actually facilitating that student, or in the case of the home-based ones, the parents are facilitating that student. So you've got at least two or three people that have been involved in this educational experience. Um, we don't do PD and teacher ed, well, particularly teacher ed. Um, and in Canada, this is probably even worse than what it was in the US uh, when the, uh, Catherine and Leanna actually looked at it. Um, but when Carrie Rice and Lisa Dolly actually looked at, I think it was over 3,000 online teachers, and 40%, four to 10 reported that they started teaching their online course with no professional development on how to teach online whatsoever. And that's even worse when you figure that, unless they were lucky enough to be one of the people that went to the 2% of universities in the United States that make any reference to online or village learning in their teacher ed curriculum, you know, these folks are really screwed. And we have the same thing in many of our programs here in Canada. You know, at the undergraduate level, so our pre-service teachers coming up, you don't see much in the way of how do I facilitate an online student that's at my school that might be sitting in the library in the back of the room. If I had to design an online course or online content for my own blended course, how do I go about doing it? We've got a couple of graduate certificates and stuff like that that are starting to pop up now. Um, other than some isolated examples, I know of about seven students across the country that have been able to do their student teaching in an online environment, but that's about it. And those were always exceptions, and they actually had to go through multiple levels of approval at the university just to be able to do that. You know, whereas you know we have literally thousands of teachers across the country that are just teaching an online environment alone, not teaching the face-to-face -face environment at all. Um, from the research, we can say that for the most part, asynchronous teaching takes much more time than face-to-face -face teaching or from synchronous online instruction. Uh, we can also say that. Um, when it comes to professional development and teacher training, that it's best when it's delivered in an online format. Makes sense, you know, if you want to teach online students, it's good to have an experience of being an online learner yourself. Um, it tends, teachers tend to teach better when they have the ability to design or at least dramatically adapt the content that they have. There are a couple of good initiatives that I can point to that have shown some good uh, results when it comes to research. And the nice thing is they're actually all open, so um, regardless of where you're located, you can get access to them and it doesn't cost anything. Um, the Georgia Online, or sorry, the Georgia Virtual, actually, should you just, yeah, the Georgia Virtual School uh, has this uh, teaching online open learning, uh, which is essentially an online uh, program that they require all of their online teachers to go through before they start. Uh, Kennesaw State University uh, every spring semester, which for us is winter, uh, it's, it's Georgia, so they don't actually have winter there. So their January to April semester is called spring semester. Uh, but essentially, January to April every year, um, Anissa Vega runs a MOOC that's focused on online blended learning that you can actually get credit at Kennesaw State for if you want, or you can just take it for your own um, learning. Uh, it's actually being offered again this, June, uh, this January, and you can see the link there. As well, uh, UC Irvine, their extension department, has a five-course virtual teacher specialization 
uh, that's offered through the Coterra platform. So again, you can go in and take one or more of those courses. There's one on teaching, one on evaluation, and one on course design. I can't remember what the other two are off the top of my head. Uh, but again, you can take those for free. And they tend to be fairly generic enough. I mean, most of the examples that they use come out of the U.S., although, and this is actually because she has such a, an international audience in that move, uh, tend to be a bit better in terms of its coverage of outside the U.S. Uh, but when you're looking at sort of the pedagogical strategies that they're talking about and the models of instructional design that have been found to be effective, it doesn't matter if you're a supplemental program in the U.S. or a supplemental program in Canada. Those are going to translate fairly nicely. Um, one of the things that we probably have, it's probably, I guess, our most promising, promising practice at this stage in terms of the research that's out there, um, deals with the facilitator. That school-based personnel or that local level personnel that we have that um, supports the student, they are actually critical in this enterprise. Um, the best research that we have to date basically suggests that um, they can actually mitigate about a 5 to 10 percent loss if you have an active and engaged facilitator. Um, if you have a facilitator that actually has gone through some kind of training, they tend to be much more effective than folks at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, through a IES grant actually have an open source training program uh, through their National Research Center for Rural Education Support. So you can actually go and get a full online PD that they've got for their facilitators. And you know they found that to be incredibly uh, effective both in terms of student performance and student retention in the online environment. Now it was only one three-year study that they were doing so you know, again, still fall into that promising practices stage, but uh, it's probably some of the best results that we've seen coming out of any of these promising practices. Um, for those of you that may work in the full-time environment, or those of you that have full-time students in your jurisdiction, um, there are a couple of things that are of important. Um, parental involvement, which makes sense if you're thinking about that's the facilitator in the full-time environment. Um, they are in very important to this. Uh, while we tell them that they're not necessarily strictly content-based teachers, in most instances they tend to provide a significant amount of subject-based instruction. Um, we actually have one validated tool that is fairly good at actually measuring parental involvement and using that as a predictor for success. Um, we also have a line of inquiry that Jared Borup and Lisa Hassel Waters have been doing that look at strategies for fostering parent engagement which you know have some promise to them. Um, although interestingly, one of the things that we tend to find is that as the student tends to start doing better in the full-time environment, the parental engagement actually drops off. Since the parents are really involved when their kids are struggling. And then once they start to do well, that's when it drops off. And then oftentimes the student starts to struggle again. So finding ways to keep them engaged is important for those of you in the full-time environment. Probably the best instrument that we have, and it's probably the most underutilized instrument, is Peg Robillier, Margaret Robillier's Educational Success, Success Prediction Instrument, which is something that if you're not familiar with it, I can send you a copy of it. But essentially, this is a validated instrument that will determine whether or not a student will have success in an online or independent learning environment. It has a 96% prediction rate. Um, now, the caveat with it is it's a prediction instrument. You know, so we predict that you're going to fail, Brett, in this course. Go forth and fail. You know, and so the instrument isn't useful unless you have something that comes after it that can start to remediate some of the soft skills that she's measured. Now, having said that, the Michigan Virtual University has an online learning orientation tool, which isn't quite aligned to the ISPRI, but has actually been shown to have some success. A former doc student of mine who's at Grand Valley State University, now Jason Psycho, actually has an online orientation that he's developed that directly aligns with the instrument. So if you are looking to use that particular instrument, you want to use an orientation module that's directly aligned to it to try to uh, support students in that way, contact Jason because he is very interested in having folks go out and test his module to see how it's working and actually revising it based upon the results that you find, so it's going to be more useful to you guys in the end. 